Hello and welcome to season 8, episode 17 of the Ubuntu podcast. It's Tuesday the 30th of June and we're going to discuss what's been happening in the news and in the community. I'm Laura and joining me this week are the full gang of Alan. Hello, hello. Martin. Hello. And Mark. Hello. Hey, uh, it's formal today, isn't it? None of you are higher or anything like that. Hey, uh. <laughs> oh, it's very hot, polished. It? It's really hot, everyone, yeah. Has everyone got their windows open? You know, yeah. Train yep. noises and birds and yeah. stuff in the background. Yeah. Cows here. Cows? Mm. Okay. Very what rural. do you have, Martin? Trains, cows? No, I just have a chest infection, so I should try <laughs> hard not to cough. Oh, we the lucky ones. Lovely. Oh, there's, there's a volunteer doing this remotely, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> there certainly is, yeah. Mm. Okay. Let's go. And now it's time for some news. And this week, uh, we can report that the Unity 3D editor for Linux is coming along quite nicely. And the Unity 3D editor is the uh, game development engine. Um, It's got uh, over 200,000 votes on the Unity 3D feedback site. And Natosha Bard, a developer at Unity Technologies, has written um, on his blog that the Unity 3D editor port... uh, Oh, is it her? Okay. Um, That uh, the Linux... um, a port is basically a labour of love, and that some of the Unity, Unity developers have been working hard on and off to port and maintain the port of the Unity editor to Linux for quite some time, and it's been pretty much the poster child of their internal developer hack weeks. Um, and uh, the blog goes on to talk about some of the issues that they've encountered uh, with compiler directives making assumptions that it's either Windows or Mac OS X. And, of course, now there's a third platform. Those L statements are catching them out. Uh, and from a um, developer's point of view, it's quite an interesting read. Yeah. But from a game developer's point of view, uh, they say that uh, it, the experimental build should be coming out soon. Um, uh, they've switched to GTK for the window and event handling and the menu system rather than raw X11. Yeah, that really surprised me. And that they, you know, when they started it, they were trying to avoid toolkits altogether, so they just wrote the whole thing in raw X11. Yeah, it looks as though maybe longer term the plan is to use Unity's own UI elements yeah. to do this at some point in the future, oh. but they're using GTK for now. Um, it'll only be a 64-bit version and it will be officially supported on Ubuntu back to 1204 and other distributions are going to be on their own but it should work and the installer will likely be uh, distributed as as a dev package so this will be great because it will then mean that uh, game developers can actually develop their Linux titles on Linux yeah it's it's awesome and uh, the fact that this this has been you know the highest ranked thing on the Unity 3D feedback site. It's like as you said, it's two hundred thousand votes, and people just keep on saying, "Please make a Linux port." Um, and you know, for ages and ages and ages, it has felt like you know. And every time I mention it, and every time uh, Natosha Bard and uh, someone else who works there, who goes by the name Tack, uh, posts on Google Plus, I always reply, "Ah, oh, so how's that Linux port coming along?" And they're, and they're kind of dismissive, and then suddenly they come along and post this, which is brilliant because it's like it's it to me this feels the same way as when Steam finally said, uh, Valve finally said, "Hey, look, we've got this build for Linux." It's like, "Oh yes, there we are." It was good to hear. Am I the only one interested in this? <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear it described no, no, as a like, labour of love as well yeah. by the developers. You know, they're actually yeah. like passionate about doing it, not just because, you know, they don't see it as a major sort of business strategy thing, but they just see it as something which they really want to see themselves. Right. It's how I, I think that's how they, um, the Spotify client on Linux originated. Yes. It was yeah. just one mm. or two people who work for Spotify doing it, you know, in their spare time, not, not, you know, not expecting it to be, you know, the same production level as the Windows and OS ten client, but yeah. Turns out, lots of people use it, and it works. Well, well, if there's well. anyone from, if there's anyone from Spotify listening, please update the Spotify client to support Gcrypt two zero rather than one one, because you can't run it on fifteen oh four at the moment. Picky, picky. Oh, yes. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, so, 
In other news, uh, sent in by Runjaj on Twitter, I think, uh, Toyota have settled a case of unintended acceleration in the US after, which I'm sure is you know not remotely funny, but actually sounds it, uh, in the US after a woman was unable to brake on an off-ramp and had to throw the handbrake on, which failed to stop the car, leading to severe injuries for herself and the death of her friend. The handbrake left evidence that she had braked, though, and the jury found Toyota guilty. An expert software specialist spent 20 months going through Toyota's source code and criticised their software development practices, describing the code as spaghetti code. Um, Like, task deaths would disable fail-safes, memory corruption, single-point failures, inadequate protection against stack overflow, a buffer overflow, and single-fault containment regions. I have no idea what half of those things mean. No, they they copy and paste that. Bad stuff. 10,000 global variables. Basically, all sorts of things can cause things to potentially, things that that, um, might execute which shouldn't execute or fail to execute which should execute or, you know, go over specified limits, uh, fail to cut out in the event of an emergency. Um, And I'd be very alarmed if uh, that system was running my car and I really hope it isn't. Wow. I know a software engineer who got i think it was the audi quattro partly because he knew it was mechanical and not run by software yeah i think my car's probably cheap enough that it's not (laughs) too then mine is too yes although they are made by toyota i I did uh, enjoy uh one of my cars where uh when there was a part that broke and uh, it was the accelerator and uh, rather than any kind of software patch or you know anything like that we threaded a piece of garden wire through the <laughs> through the dash through the bulkhead, and I had to pull this garden wire to accelerate the car. I had to wow! One handed driving. Excellent. So, yeah, uh, that's that's the kind of uh, soft- hardware patch that I like. <laughs> wacky software that's in a black box, and you know this is you know, it's really serious. It's caused yeah. you know the death of someone and injuries to someone else, and it's a black box. And this is the, the kind of thing that. Um, you know, we talk about and we hear about at uh, free software conventions all the time is, I know Karen Sandler talked about, um, you know, having non-free software inside her in a pacemaker. Yes. But, you know, it's it's just as relevant when it's outside you, but, you know, you're in a metal box and hurtling down the road at, you know, tens of miles per hour. And this thing, you know, makes a decision that's counterintuitive. It's uh, yeah. it's quite alarming. Yeah. There was an interesting story actually run on, I think, the BBC future news or something posted it on twitter saying about how two uh um self-driving cars had encountered each other in san francisco and nearly collided when what actually happened was they recognized each other and moved e- moved out of the way of one another but yeah it was described as yeah they nearly hit each other but then it made me think well actually all of our cars are nearly hitting each other all the time yeah. <laughs> well, i don't know about the way you drive but yeah well, it's like um you know airline near misses yeah you know, i know there is a standard definition of what a near miss is but the whole you know the whole point is they did miss yeah yeah <laughs> hmm. i think that's an airplane in the background <laughs> <laughs> nearly missing yeah Mark. Your Mark? oh sorry that's me um so some Ubuntu 15.10 flavors have released Alpha 1. Uh, we discussed this uh, a bit in the last episode, or maybe the episode before that. Um, the flavors who are participating in this round of uh, pre-releases are Kubuntu, Lubuntu, Ubuntu, if, if we decide that's pronounced Chilin <laughs> or Kylin. It's Chilin. Chilin. Ubuntu Chilin and Ubuntu Mate. It's like the most relaxed. Of chilling and mates. Yeah. Like, yeah. We chill in. Yeah, it's totally laid back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Kubuntu 1510 Alpha is using the latest Plasma 5.3 desktop and associated technologies and comes loaded with KDE applications 1504.1. Uh, Lubuntu 1510 is a general... Uh, uh, is <laughs> Sorry. Lubuntu 1510 in general is set to be another minor bug fix release as the work continues to the next gen uh, LXQ desktop. Ubuntu Mate 1510 Alpha 1. Well, why don't I let you uh, tell us about that, Martin? Um, Mostly this was refinement, so it's all under the hood stuff, um, fixes and such. But there's a new version of the Mate Tweak Tool, which is what you use to reconfigure the user interface and window managers. And TLP, uh, a power management application, is now being 
integrated to improve uh, battery endurance. And there's now um, some refinement to the Ubuntu Mate core tasks and meta packages. So you can now use the mini ISO to install a bare bones system. And does uh, Mate Tweak now have uh, less esoterically named options? Uh, no, that's in the current development oh, right. branch. <laughs> so yeah, that's coming uh, hopefully for Alpha Two. Um, um, and is TLP planning uh, going to be coming to any other flavors, or is that just a Mate thing? Uh, well, it's in um, the Debian official archive, and it's in the Ubuntu official archive. So anybody could add that to their seeds and ship it. I just wonder why we don't. I mean, well, it's in universe, isn't it? So it won't go on the CD unless it's promoted to main. But I just wondered why, you know, why this is well, especially it, it, uh, you well, know something you've you've put in and nobody else has. No, it was something that I always wanted to include by default, and when I saw it turn up in the archive, I've added it. And the fact that it's in universe is not a problem for me because the majority of my packages are in universe. Right. Okay. Um, and I'd just like to apologise. Um, a couple of episodes ago, I was asking for a call for participation for the flavours in Alpha 1, Alpha 2, Beta 2, um, or Beta 1 uh, testing, and I was completely wrong. It wasn't an all-or-nothing affair, as this article clearly demonstrates. We were able to do an Alpha release with just a few of the flavours participating, not everyone involved. So I got that wrong, and I apologise. <laughs> I know, I must do better. <laughs> just move on and just rub that out and forget about it. Laura, what's yeah. next? <clears throat> the Maizu MX4 Ubuntu phone went on sale on Thursday, June 6, 25th. Um, the Ubuntu edition handset will be sold through Maizu's international facing online store, but only in Europe for €299, Euros, excluding shipping. Um, there's a catch in that it's an invite-only launch. Um, So you'll have to find the invites by clicking around in an interactive origami wall hosted on the Meizu website and hidden behind the wall is several several hundred invitations to buy the phone. I did try, I got sent a link to a video of this wall and the video wouldn't work so I haven't actually seen this origami wall. Oh no, you're going to miss out on the phone then, Laura. There are people who haven't been able to buy the phone because they can't get through the website and then there's someone who's videoed it and you can't even watch the video of someone not yeah. being able to get through the website. So I like that. <laughs> yeah. I like, so when... I like the origami sorry, thing, though, because on the um, BQ uh, E4.5 phone, the original one that came out in January, um, the box was made of origami, basically, which was really mm. cool. So I quite like the origami thing and the design of the wallpaper and that. So the um, the whole you know, sort of work it out, find an invitation approach to the sale is actually what put me off buying the MX4 and why I went for the BQ uh, Aquarius 5 Um, because I couldn't be doing with all that messing around. After the flash sales of the BQ 4.5, I wasn't going to go through this sort of thing again. So, yeah, I'm wondering if maybe they'd sell a few more and how many other people have been put off by these fun and games. Well, mm, yeah, I I think... You don't necessarily want to necessarily sell a few more because someone who wants to buy one will go through that faff or just wait until the faff passes in a month's time and buy one, you know, like a normal person. Um, uh, But I think, you know, part of the problem is you don't want everyone in the world to buy one right now because it isn't ready for everyone in the world. You know, if you get if you end up with a million sales of an MX4 and of those million people, 900,000 of them want WhatsApp, and we haven't got WhatsApp, then that's quite a lot of returns that Meizu are going to have to handle, and nobody's going to be happy about that. So, you know, there is method in the madness, although frustrating, I, I appreciate it must be for some people. And to be fair, not most people aren't going to buy it until you can walk into a car phone warehouse and get it on a contract anyway. Right. So, you know, it's oh, not a big concern cool. whether lots of people are going to buy it or whether just the people who really want to get one so they can develop apps. That's probably more important, which I think yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. is more like. Yeah, there are rational, people, yeah. you know, normal reasons why, you know, strange people might want one. <laughs> <laughs> like us. <laughs> and today, on the day of recording, fresh news. Um, Linux fresh. Mint 17.2. <laughs> yeah, yeah, minty freshness. <laughs> Linux Mint 17.2, Raffaella, uh, the Cinnamon Editions and the Mate Editions have been released uh, today. 
Um, the uh, Cinnamon Edition comes with Cinnamon 2.6, and the Mate Edition comes with Mate 1.10. Anything new in, in this new release of Mint? Well, uh, the Cinnamon Edition, they've uh, done some work to address desktop, fe- uh, desktop freezes. And they've uh, uh, no need to recompile now when, when you're moving between login kit and console kit, so it supports both. And they've done a load of work to improve the responsiveness and the load times and CPU usage of uh, the Cinnamon desktop as a whole. Um, and they've improved uh, multi-monitor support and uh, added um, the ability to use the traditional sort of um, screensaver um, oh, uh, hacks, thing. as they're known. Yeah, right. yeah. Cool. Um, so so in terms of Cinnamon, there's th- that's sort of the headline features that I'm aware of. In terms of Mate, very quickly, um, there's now a plugin manager for um, the uh, Kaja file manager, so you can just turn them off at, on and off at runtime or configure them at runtime, whereas before you had to either log in and log out or um, uh, restart the um, Kaja um, file manager uh, completely, so that it manages the whole desktop. Uh, we've got a new audio library subsystem, which now abstracts away um, Pulse Audio, ALSA or OSS, so there's no app build time options and all of the old uh, GStreamer 0.10 stuff has been thrown away. And um, we've now... Uh, done some other stuff i'm just looking at uh, looking at this release those are the only two things that mint uh, mint uh, make reference of but uh, atrial now supports epub and there's a stack of bug fixes and it more importantly um vlad orlov did um some static code analysis and has fixed a ton of um, memory leaks and things like that awesome so is the from what i hear linux mint is a popular desktop and a lot of people use it uh or popular distro sorry so can you upgrade from previous releases to this one? Yeah, so the Linux Mint 17 releases, so there were 17, then 17.1 and 17.2, they're all based on Ubuntu 14.04. Right, from the LTS. So, from the LTS. So it's not the same sort of um, distribution release upgrade process, so it's really um, new packages that come in um, to the system, and therefore you can upgrade... Um, fairly well easily it just works between between releases right and that's probably all we've got time for in the news yes and now it's time for some community news and events so first of all, uh, following on from uh, the news in our last new show, I believe, or maybe the one before that, it's been going on for quite a while, after much public controversy, the Ubuntu Community Council and Kubuntu Council have met with Mark Shuttleworth and Jonathan Riddell to chart a path forward. Jonathan Riddell has removed his membership on the Kubuntu Council launchpad group as the Community Council required. The Ubuntu fridge post, which we spoke about previously, has been removed as the Ubuntu ca- as the Kubuntu Council requested, and provisions are being made to better handle cases where there is potential conflict of interest for a member of the Community Council in the future. Mm. So this draws a line under it, does it? For the time being, perhaps. Let's, Leah, let's hope so. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we shall see. Right. There were lots of positive mutual statements that they, Kubuntu and Ubuntu both recognised that they were at reach important to one another and that they wanted to move on and put this behind them. So let's hope that everyone can get along and make some progress. The announcement did look like it had been collaboratively edited by about 25 different people to make sure that <laughs> absolutely nobody yeah. was offended yeah. at all. <laughs> it was quite carefully worded clearly and yeah. didn't Remarkably really PC. say much at all <laughs> <laughs> best kind of yeah, so the korean local team have set up their own localized ask ubuntu site Ooh. do we not yeah, have these brilliant. already then no so you know the ask ask dot no ask ubuntu dot com that um is hosted by stack exchange and yes. the big problem with it is it is english only and there's no plan to make it translatable um, stack exchange itself yeah 
it's 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 not it's not a it's all english as far as i know i mean there are free software alternatives to stack exchange there are lots of them um and uh, i'm not sure which one they've used or whether they've rolled their own um mainly because i can't read korean (laughs) um but but um it it's great and i think more loco teams should do exactly this to Mm -hmm. you know to to provide support um in this because this question and answer type of site works brilliantly it's it bubbles up you know popular questions and answers to the top of the search engine rankings and dumb answers get voted down and good answers generally get voted up and uh it's not like forums (laughs) no forums suck this is way better than (laughs) forums in my humble opinion they're using um using a system called question to answer which is a free and open source platform for q a sites according to their website so they're they're better than us. <laughs> and Mark's better than you at reading exchange. Korean. No, I, I uh, you, the, the footer, in fact, is in English. If you scroll down. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> Stack Exchange is actually non-free and yeah. it runs on Windows, uh, I think. So uh, yeah, it's all it's all rather horrible, but uh, yeah. But yeah. Cool. Mm. Martin, did you want to say something? Uh, no, I was just going to make the same remark that Mark has about what they were using. Cool. Next up, uh, an internet nobody has suggested making Android apps run on the Ubuntu phone. Who is this internet nobody? Uh, don't know, some bald guy off a uh, rubbish podcast. Mr. <laughs> Mr. John <laughs> yeah. I'm O'Bacon. being cruel. Some heavy <laughs> mentalist. Of course, the internet's John O'Bacon, everyone's favourite community manager. Yeah, it was kind of a surprising blog post. Out of the blue, he wrote up saying that he thought that uh, Ubuntu... Or he didn't think. No, he, he didn't think. Was offering the suggestion that... We he'd should been, discuss this. He'd been discussing it with a friend. My guess was that he and Ack late at night had been drinking and came up with this idea. That's <laughs> total speculation, yeah. but I'm guessing that might yeah. be what happened. I uh, Yeah, I was going to say, I think there was too much eggnog involved in this blog post. <laughs> yeah. So what what, what is the suggestion? That, that throw out Ubuntu and, and just basically have a skin on top of Android? Exactly, yeah. Well, the yeah. the kernel is Android anyway, isn't it? Because the oh, the drivers are bits. Android. It has bits from Android, yeah. Okay, uh, and it's kind of a merge of of the what you would call the Ubuntu kernel, which is you know the upstream Linux kernel plus our patches, plus the bits that are necessary to access the radio and drive the other drivers. Yes, but essentially, um, it sounds like he was he's suggesting that Ubuntu for the phone becomes another Android distro, basically. Just like Sony have theirs and Samsung have theirs and Google have and theirs. Huawei have theirs and yeah, exactly. And all these yeah. Others. But Canonical yeah. basically have one of those which looks like Unity. And the benefit being that you can then just run the existing Android ecosystem of apps. In theory, it. but the thing is he in, in the blog post he talks about it still being a free and open source platform. However, if you're just gonna have the free and open source bits of Android, then you don't get to run uh, quite a few of the apps in the Android ecosystem. Because Why, what's that? So, so if you're running AOSP, yeah, based like you know, as free software of Android as you can get it, what are you missing? Well, for example, that? you if you don't have Google Play services, you can you then can't use things like well, you can't use any of the Google apps basically, and a lot of the the newer sort of system like well, what what Ubuntu would call core apps, which um, so things like the camera now is a Google camera app rather than just the stock open source Android camera app. So you miss out on the the latest and greatest in terms of the core apps type things. And any other any other third party apps that depend on Google Play services you won't have. But would you care about that? I mean if you if, if you're just basing it on Android to have, you know, the ability to run some Android apps, you know, like let's you know the the, the canonical example is WhatsApp, right? Um you know, you could it's run not that. the canonical example. <laughs> well, it's the canonical example of Android app that everyone tells me they want. So that's small the small C. Yes, the small C. Um, and if if that's all you want, uh, then it kind of it, it seems like quite a major change just to have those few Android apps that we don't currently have yet. Yeah, and it does sort of get rid of the. Or like all of the USPs of it being the Ubuntu differentiator. Phone. Yeah, there's well, why would anyone write an Ubuntu app when they could just st- say, "Well, why should we bother? We've already got an Android app. There's no point writing an Ubuntu app when we can just write an Android one." And that's exactly the problem that 
that you know, other platforms have had. Like um, BlackBerry has the ability to run uh, some Android apps via a compatibility system. So does uh, Sailfish, and so does Tizen. And uh, I, I don't think it's you know it may well be a good stepping stone to get you over the bump. You know, like Wine is uh, for desktop apps. But I don't think it's. I, I, I'm not convinced it's a long-term viable solution to have your own differentiated product. You just end up being a box shifter like every other Android device manufacturer is. Yeah, yeah. So the conclusion is no, you shouldn't. <laughs> well, who knows? I mean, it could well be that that you know the the people who run the project decide. Well, you know, we're not getting enough traction in apps. We're not getting enough market share i don't know i'm speculating you know some months or years down the line that may be a decision that gets made and they say you know either we drop it completely or we pump a load of money into it and pay these yeah. companies to port their apps or we just switch and become an, uh, an also ran android platform and yeah. none of those are particularly enthralling prospects to me i don't you know yeah, I mean, for, I guess for me, it's less the uh, the big apps like WhatsApp, which is like you could pay, say, WhatsApp to develop a WhatsApp app. Um, and they're the ones that everybody wants. But it's when you go to a particular website, like you go to, I don't know, Virgin Trains or Debenhams or all these different companies now are bringing out their own apps. And some are better than others, but, you know, they're not going to create indefinitely more and more different apps so i guess that's one argument for having the android app everywhere right uh, but but you know there there are other platforms that are in that position as well you yeah know, so uh windows phone is a good example unfortunately windows phone is not a good example because they do have a bottomless pit of money that they throw at people in order to port their apps and some people do it um and, but it depends how the apps are created because some of them are written using things like um, Cordova and those things can be ported to Ubuntu fairly easily. Mm. And a lot of these companies that make a, a quickie app just to say they've got an app, you know, install yeah. our app, when in fact, you know, it's no better than just visiting the website and, you know, having a mobile version of the website. Those kind of apps can come across fairly straightforwardly if they're, like, done with a, a toolkit that, that can... Uh, be ported to Ubuntu easily, but the the problem comes with the really deep, you know, deeply integrated into Android things that are very mu much more difficult to to port. Yeah. Mm. Moving on, uh, we have one last bit of news, and that is that there is going to be an <laughs> OnCamp. <laughs> yeah, Yay! we don't have drums. Actually, we do have drums, but I'm not going to use it. Uh, we have OnCamp has been announced by Dan Lynch on Twitter that uh, OGCamp 2015 is happening, and it's happening at Liverpool John Moores University in Liverpool uh, on October 30th through to November 1st. So it's the last weekend in October 2015. There will be an OGCamp in Liverpool. Awesome. Halloween weekend. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. We don't do Halloween in the UK, though, do we? Yeah, we do. Oh, we're not all dressing up, are we? No, we don't dress up in stupid costumes. We dress up as witches and... And right, and do trick or treat and yeah. get sweets. Right, okay. So, uh, I guess we're going to start looking for sponsors and uh, people to give talks and identify hotels and um, all the other stuff that we do uh, <laughs> building up to, uh, to Og Camp. Um, Les Pounder is probably the person to get in contact with if you want to get involved and help um, crew the, uh, the event because yeah. uh, he usually organises that kind of thing. I think he is again. Uh, this year uh, if you know someone who would like to sponsor it uh, get in touch with uh, Dan, Dan or Les yeah and uh, yeah we'll build up and sp uh, let you know more details as they emerge right now all we know is it will happen and the date it will happen and where it will happen we know nothing more than that you know as much as we do now <laughs> cool is that the end of the community I believe news? it is I think it is right. yeah feels like it And that's it for episode 17. We'll be back next week when we'll be reviewing some hardware, lots of hardware, and we'll 
bring you our thoughts on that hardware. <laughs> Did you like that? Nice. Was it obvious? Very that professional. Was seamless. <laughs> Absolutely. If I didn't know better, I'd think that you were just curled up on your sofa rather than sitting, you know, professionally at a at table a and might behind a desk, somewhere. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I haven't got my knees tucked up underneath me at all. <laughs> no. Awesome. Well, that was good fun. It's still really warm, isn't it? Yeah. Hope it's it cools down warm. for next week. Uh, not we'll sure see you about next that. Next week. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye.